um, interviewed some incredible drivers like Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton, just by just kept asking and asking and asking. And eventually they said yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then suddenly I'm up in front of these guys um, being interviewed or interviewing them rather um, Mm -hmm. weekend in, weekend out. Uh, traveling the world yep. having the best time long hours uh, stressful at times but I have the best time hey everyone welcome to the track limits podcast presented by formula addict I'm your host swish I'm with my co-host Henny and today we have an incredibly recognizable face in the paddock if you watch the f1 races you're probably seeing him go up and down the paddock <laughs> it is the one and only Lawrence Barreto Woo! welcome Welcome. Oh, thanks, chaps. This is very exciting. I'm oh, very, very happy to be here. And that was quite some intro. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thanks very much. I get inspired. I yes. get inspired. But I'm so excited to have you here. I mean, you're obviously somebody that we greatly look up to in yep. many aspects. That's very kind. And I think throughout this entire hour, I'm really excited to unpack an incredible career you've had thus far. Because mm-hmm. I think some people, you know, they see you on F1 and they don't really know all the accomplishments, all the milestones, maybe even the challenges that you've gone through. So I'm pretty excited to kind of go deeper into, into all of that. Well, you successfully made me feel very old. Yeah. Oh, Thank you very much. No, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. No, it's been fun. Yeah, I've had a good run. So yeah, Incredible. so far, so awesome. good. So we break up our podcast into three sections. Q1, all related to racing. Q2, kind of diving more into you as a professional. And then Q3, our favorite, oh. the rapid fire round. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to yeah. I'm <laughs> stressed in equal measure. So oh, that's that's incredible. Like incredible. So we're going to get into Q1. First question, in about 30 seconds or so, try to, <laughs> how would you describe your career and some of the core accomplishments you're proud of? I would say my career has been interesting, quirky, unusual. Um, I started a journalism degree, mm-hmm. very, very core, cool, but then I've kind of worked my way through asking people for jobs, taking a lot of no's along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, interviewed some incredible drivers like Michael Schumacher, Lewis Hamilton, just by just kept asking and asking and asking. And eventually they said yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then suddenly I'm up in front of these guys um, being interviewed or interviewing them rather um, Mm -hmm. weekend in, weekend out, uh, traveling the world, having the best time, long hours, uh, stressful at times, but I have the best time. Wow. Incredible. And you're not lying about traveling the world. I remember the first time we met you was in New York. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we saw you in the customs line. We did. And I was like, oh my God, it's Lawrence Barreto. <laughs> <We did>. like, <laughs> right? Like, and I think at the event too, the AlphaTauri car launch, you were like telling us that, hey, man, it's like one of the many car launches that you're covering. And that was even before the season started. You were just all over the place. Yeah. So when I met you guys yeah. in that custom line, yeah. I was so tired oh. because I'd, I'd done New York the week before mm-hmm. for Red Bull, mm-hmm. I was yes. about to do 24 hours or so. And then I got to hang out with you guys at the Alphatari lunch, which is yep. cool. Yep. But I wasn't, you know, I was here, there and everywhere in that period. My most fun period of the year, actually, because you get to see the new cars, mm-hmm. you get to meet the people, everyone's excited. But I get to go like here, there and everywhere, mm-hmm. just depending on where a team wants to launch. But um, I was pretty tired, I think, when yeah, I was yeah, there. Yeah. You, so, yep. yeah. And what does the day to day life, though, look like for you, even especially during the season? Like, are you typically like able to get some free time or are you kind of just traveling from one place to another, writing, you know, reporting, all of that? So luckily, yeah. I get to spend some time at home. So yeah, my nice. fiance gets to see me so yes. I think that's a good start and my friends remember who I am my family yeah. who I am but um I'm very much kind of hopping around the world so mm-hmm. from around February time when car launches season starts till around the end of November early December mm-hmm. um I'm hopping about spending time at home when I can try to get out to play some golf if I can and nice. um, I love eating burgers so I try to go and find the world's best burger that's nice. kind of a, a pursuit of mine which is cool do you give them reviews yeah, yeah. yeah. so at the okay. moment I think I've eaten around 135 different burgers Whoa. and I've got a silver notebook that yeah. I've ranked them all yeah. and one day when I get time I will write a book about my nice. favorite burgers so that is the plan um but at the moment Formula One consumes my life yeah. we've got 23 races mm-hmm this year and I do shoots in between races as well so it's not just going from one race to another um it's a real mix though I think I did 45 50 flights last year so that's kind of around the ballpark of where I'm at at the minute and how how has the sport changed since your time starting as a journalist it's changed a lot in 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 positive ways I think because the access is so much better now I feel like I was very lucky at the start to get the opportunity to talk to drivers, to talk to engineers, team bosses, and get an insight into what was going on. Mm. And fans didn't really have that kind of access beyond what us as journalists were telling them. Whereas now, drivers spend so much time on social media. Mm. There's so much more access to drivers outside of the circuit. And I think people, if I was a fan now, I'd feel like I'd know the drivers a little bit more. 
find out what they're doing beyond between races, what they're at races. So I think from an access point of view, it's changed. I think from a racing perspective, I've always loved it. From the first race I watched in 94 to the races that I watch now, I've always enjoyed watching Grand Prix, watching the drivers spat, have spats if they have spats. <laughs> um, you know, the the overtakes, like just everything about it. The politics I love, the mm-hmm. politics. <laughs> oh, the okay. one. I think the it's drama. great. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. drama. It's just yeah. so good. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of bumbled along. It just is seen differently. And because you get more access, you see more of these stories come nice. through. So I think that's probably the real difference. Yeah. And take us through how do you even prepare for whether you're writing an article or a feature on a driver or even just a team itself. How do you prepare and do your research mm. for those? We're taking notes, by the yeah. way. Yeah. 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 We're, we're learning well, as it goes. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, you guys will know that yeah. you love motorsport so much that yeah. you watch it all the time. And so I, I watch Formula One. I read books about it. I, mm. I watch, you know, Drive to Survive, but I watch documentaries that have come out. I do everything that I can mm. to just know what's going on. And that's because I love it. So I don't really feel like I'm doing homework okay. per se and doing research. I just kind of just do what I can because I'm interested in it. Uh, I like to read around the not, what's been going on so that when I go to a Grand Prix, I, I kind of feel like I'm on top of what's going on. Mm. But a really important thing for me is just talking to people. Like mm. I do this job because I love talking to people. And that's not just sitting down and doing chats like this or, or bespoke interviews. It's just having a conversation with someone in the paddock, paddock mm. catching up with how they're getting on, um, seeing what's going on. And then you kind of build a story about what's happening. The more people you talk to, the more mm. better idea you've got about what's going on. And it takes time to build those relationships. And this is year nine, I think, for me. And now I'm starting to feel like I've got a real good understanding of who everyone is. Mm. People are starting to know who I am. And it's just a bit easier to kind of find out what's going on from that sort of side of things. And then do you have any strategies for people that are looking? I mean, I feel like the networking tips you might be able to give yeah. are applicable even beyond motorsport. Do you have any idea of like, if I was somebody coming in new to an industry and I wanted to get deeper into that industry and network with people and meet people, what are some strategies I could use to to be better at it? I think it's knowing your subject. I think that's really important. I think when I started out in journalism, I did all sports. So I, I kind of spread the, the, the net wide. Yeah. I did tennis, I did football, I did rugby, I did Olympic sports and cool. I did Formula One cool. and I just tried to build my knowledge in all of those bases and understand what I was trying to achieve what I was trying to report what were interesting stories were mm. so that when I then came in and focused in on Formula One it was it was more straightforward for me to hit the story angles quicker to ask the right questions and then when people see that you're doing that kind of thing mm-hmm. I think they open up to you in the interview. I think people hopefully respect you a little bit mm. more. And then that opens doors to other opportunities. So I think if you know your subject, even if it's just you've gone in and you've known tennis really well, but yep. you want to break into Formula One, if you can show that you know that environment and you've really put the effort in to learn that sport or learn about that specific person, mm. I think people can see how hard you've worked sure. to get to that point And hopefully they'll give you an opportunity. Cool. Yeah. And then how do you balance your work? I mean, you work with Channel 4. And then you also do a lot of reporting for F1. Mm-hmm. I mean, is I bet there is a crossover there, but like, how do you balance your time with both of them? I love to be busy. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. So um, I'm probably, uh, people call me one of the busiest people in F1. Uh, because I believe And you kind of, you mentioned right at the beginning about yeah. how you see me bouncing up and down. That mm-hmm. kind of is what my job is. Mm-hmm. I get there as soon as I'm in the paddock, I'm up and down and talking to people, doing interviews, doing bits and pieces. So I balance my job. Formula One is my core job. They're mm-hmm. the, my core employer. Yep. Um, and so that means that I'm doing TV pen interviews. I do uh, paddock lifestyle magazine shows. I do a, a core thing, a driver's parade sometimes. Mm-hmm. And then Channel 4 is just something extra that um, Formula One have set up for me, so con me out to Channel 4, and I do 10 races a year for them. Mm-hmm. And it's an opportunity to work with a different group of people, um, another great crew of presenters, David Coulthard, Mark Webber, Steve Jones, mm-hmm. um, and you get to learn from them. And I think it's a real cool way of seeing how broadcasters do it to maybe Formula One as the sport might present sport. So it's just a, it's a learning experience for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned so many skills just working with DC and, and Steve yep. and Mark um, that then I can apply to Formula One. Um, but also because I, I talk to the drivers all the time, it makes no difference really if I've got a Channel 4 microphone True. in my hand yeah. or yep. Formula One one. It will just be the style of question will be different. Right. Um, the, the topic of conversation will be slightly different depending on what the agenda is for, for, for that interview. Yeah. Mm. Um, and for me, that's great because I just love to try and get information out of a driver, let them show their best self. 
um, hopefully inform people, entertain mm -hmm. people. Um, that's what I do this job for. So yeah, yeah it's just try trying to do the balance. And yeah, they're long days, of course they are. And it's sometimes difficult that I'm, I do a channel four shoot, then I run to the form, literally <laughs> yeah. run to the yeah, form yeah. one shoot, <laughs> then I run back. And there isn't a lot of time in between to prep. So mm. it's late nights in my hotel room, writing questions down or notes for questions, mm -hmm. watching some videos about what's been going on on that day, just to make try and make sure that I'm on top of things yeah. so that when I get to those things and I bounce from one to the other, I feel super prepared for both of them. I'm not stressing that I haven't thought about this, that, and the other. That's yeah. the kind of strategy that I try to employ. Yeah, and I've always been fascinated by journalists finding the difference between a rumor yeah. compared <laughs> to what is real source. How do you guys go about picking that and finding the difference between those two. Hmm. So I think if you have a good idea about what is going on as a base level, yeah. so you know that this is true, hmm. then what you try and do is work out, well, how likely is that rumor to be true, true based yeah. on like how far away is that hmm. from what the baseline hmm. normally is? And then you go and talk to people yeah. uh, and you go and try and find out what is going on, whether they've heard anything. Often you'll hear a rumor and um, say driver A is gonna sign for driver for team A. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But already I might have been having conversations for weeks about how I know that actually that driver was never talking to the team A. Mm. I just happened to know that they were talking to B, C, D and E mm. and they would never even look at A. So then you don't really need to kind of pursue that rumor that, mu yeah. that much. Yeah. If it is that, oh, OK, that is a team that I think they were talking about and it seems like it's accelerating, then you might then go to your sources that you normally go to, have a chat to them and find out what's changed, right. like what's what's developed in that kind of path. I think these days there are so many stories out there. So many people are writing things often when they haven't been in the paddock for a period of time. And if that is the case, then you probably take that with a pinch of salt because mm -hmm. they probably haven't had the access to the mm -hmm. people that they need to. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just that you just have to try and take all of these little scenarios and Put add them, them together, together yep. and then work out the best way forward uh, to try and prove a story or, or, or break a story even. And then do you ever get surprised? Like, <laughs> I know you're in the inside, but are you sometimes also on social media and are like, what? Totally like blindsided <laughs> yeah. by the news, yeah. <laughs> as much as I love <laughs> to be on top of things yeah. and feel like I am across everything, I can't be across everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes on an airplane, and when I got on the plane, everything was fine. <laughs> right. And I got off the plane 10 or 12 Madden hours later, yeah, yeah. and something's happened and stuff. Yeah. And actually, when I'm on a plane, if I can, I try not to go on Wi Fi mm. oh, because okay. that is the one period in my life Peace. where you just <laughs> clock off. You're, you're clocked off. Like, even mm. when I'm at home on a day off, I'm working. Mm. You know, I'm at a wedding, I'm probably working. Yeah. I'm sleeping, I've got my phone on loud in mm. case something happens. Yeah. So that is the one time, I know technology has moved on, so it, you can actually communicate <laughs> yeah. with the world, but I try to like limit that area to the time in which I'm switched off. Yeah. Um, and it happens, you know, mm. you, can't, you can't be on top of every single story. Mm. The idea is that you are across as many things as you can be, so that when a story does break, even if you've missed it, you're so well, mm. um, resourced and you've got so much knowledge about that subject anyway it's about asking a few extra questions to some key sources that means that you've already got the bulk of the story yep. if you want to do an analysis because that's what i love about the sport so say carlos Sainz has um signed a new two-year contract with ferrari what i love about that is okay getting that story out there is cool but it's explaining mm. why mm. So if I've already got a base knowledge of I know how long they've been talking, I know why Ferrari wanted it, I know why Carlos wanted to stay. Mm. If I've got all of those things already in my head and I just need to go and find out, well, how much is it roughly for and some key details, then that's the buzz that I get because right. I kind of hope that that piece that I eventually write yeah. is useful to people, that yeah. they, it, that people feel that it they've learned color. something. Mm. Exactly. Right. Um, and so that's what really gets me excited, I think, mm. about journalism, those kind of analysis And pieces. how do you stay objective? Because, I mean, we both have favorites, and, of like, course. we don't try to promote those favorites mm -hmm. too much, but I bet you have your favorites too. And I don't want to know who they are as much as, like, when you're doing an interview with a team, a driver, a principal, like, mm -hmm. how do you stay objective as mm -hmm. a journalist to, like, be neutral in your questions and your approach and in answering, you know, what they have to say? I think you genuinely have to think about it all right. the time, yeah. and it is really difficult mm -hmm. because... Um, these people that you're interviewing at the start are maybe up there and are kind of elite and heroes. Mm. But when you spend so much time with them, they become people. people. Mm. Yeah. And so I see them at airports. I see them at, in, in restaurants. I go out for dinner with them. You mm. know, you do things that you would do with your friends, family, colleagues. And then it 
kind of starts to blur a little bit. Right. But I think what you always have to bring it back to is when you're asking a question, they will always have respect for you mm -hmm. to ask the question. So mm -hmm. even if they're your friend or you don't like them, if you ask them a fair question and they think, oh, that's harsh, a friend didn't <laughs> ask me that, <laughs> they know they have the respect for you that yeah. you're asking it because that's your job mm -hmm. in the same way that they've got a job to do if they can't ever talk to you for some reason or they can't tell you something at that point in time. So I think so long as you can build that respect with people mm -hmm. and that only comes with time, mm -hmm. that I think that you can always then still get on well with people, you can have favorites, mm -hmm. you can sometimes become friends with people, mm -hmm. but I think you can always be able to separate out when it's a work time and when it isn't a work time. And that's on both sides of the, of the circle, yeah. really. And what, what uh, cool initiatives or things that are happening within F1 that you are you really excited to know about or to even, you know, sponsor or push out? Um, I think at the moment, yeah. um, so I love my car. I drive a BMW Z4. Nice. And obviously the way the world is going, internal combustion engines mm. might not be a thing in in the future because um, we're moving towards maybe battery. But if we yep. can deliver sustainable fuels, I will get to keep my car. Yeah. So on a very <laughs> selfish level, yeah. if we could have a world where a 100% sustain sustainable fuel yeah. exists and it is readily available to the world, that mm. is great. There are 2 billion, I think, internal combustion engines on, on the planet. If you can find a fuel that can then be used in those and then therefore is very carbon neutral and will hit our net zero targets. Mm -hmm. Why would you not push yeah. down that path, especially when performance won't be affected? Yep. Uh, people will be happy because they'll get to keep vintage cars. Like I think there's, because I love motorsports and automotive, mm -hmm. I think that's a really cool thing to mm -hmm. be able to push on. And I think it's really cool that Formula One is kind of pushing down that path and yeah. the technology that has to go in, the investment that has to go in, the, the cleverness that is involved yep. and the scientists yeah. that are working on it, that that's a proper breakthrough if we are mm. able to deliver not just Formula One running on sustainable fuels, but then push it out to the wider market. So I'm super excited about that. And I really hope that it does follow through. And I think F2 is using a slightly higher percentage this year as well. And they'll mm -hmm. keep building as well. And they're like a guinea pig in a nice way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I'm super excited about that kind of thing nice. going forward. And that's one of many things I love about Formula One. I mentioned I love the politics and mm -hmm. obviously love the racing. But I think Formula One is the peak of technology. Mm -hmm. People across the world, when they hear about Formula One, they often don't know about the sport inside. They mm -hmm. just know that actually they came up with all of these cool right technological advancements that they are now using in their business. I know the British cycling team have taken a load of technology from Formula One and that's why they were so successful at mm. the Olympics. Lots of other sports have done that, lots of other businesses. And mm. I think that's a really cool aspect of Formula One that actually we probably don't talk enough about. Definitely not, definitely yeah. not. And I think even beyond the net zero goal, is there any other challenges that you see Formula One needing to compete with or needing to just you know directly engage with? Well, I think the, ch the obvious challenge is that we are a global sport mm -hmm. and we have to travel around the world and we have to yeah. transport 2,000 people. <laughs> and there isn't really any way of doing that. You have to send those people yep. to those races to make that event happen. Mm -hmm. And um, we've talked a lot about um, in, in the media, regional calendars, you mm -hmm. know, trying to group races together. But it really isn't as simple as saying, right, all of the American races have to go together and all of the... Asian races have why, to get together. That, why is that not as simple? Because I mean, to an average fan, they're like, well, why don't you why just stay you just, in yeah. the United States and if you're already there? I get that. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. It's kind of things like Canada, for example. You can only race there in Montreal at certain times of the year. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, 100% understand. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You know what it's like. Winters are harsh, yeah. <laughs> Winters are super harsh. Yeah. Can't race a Formula One car. So there's a narrow window. Yeah. And right. that window might not necessarily be the same window as Miami's mm. window. Perfect. And therefore, they can't then coexist. But in an ideal world, they would because geographically yeah. Yeah. they would do. Mm. Same as with Japan, uh, Singapore. There's there's certain things, t areas where they want to be in certain places. Singapore love to be in that scenario in that part of the year in September. Yep. Japan love it too, but we would love them to be earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. But it's just difficult. What other events? What other sporting events are happening at that time of year? Yep. They don't want to have clashes. Melbourne. They've got the Australian Open in Melbourne. They've got other sporting events. They can't have the Grand Prix in town same at the same time. time. Yeah. So yep. there's so many other things when you piece together a calendar yeah. that it's just not that easy to do. So mm -hmm. I suppose you just try and make the best of it where you can, try and group the races that you can do together. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be a step forward. Wow. Yeah, and where do you see, I know uh, Formula One is constantly increasing the races. Mm -hmm. And right now we're at 23, they want to expand to 25. Are you a proponent of that? Or you're like, okay, this is enough. We need to 
put a gap on this. So when I first started watching F1, I'm pretty sure there were 15 to 16 <laughs> yeah. races. And the season ran something like March to October. Yeah. yeah. And most of those were in Europe. You mm-hmm. maybe had a, fly, a couple of flyways at the start and a couple at the end. So the championship and the com- the the way it looks is completely different mm-hmm. now. And in many ways, I think that's a great thing. I think it's great. We've got three races in America. Mm-hmm. I think that's where the fan base is growing. So you need to go where the fan base is. Yeah. I think it's great we're pushing to have a race in Africa because if it's a world yes. championship, um, you do you, it. you've got to do it, right? Yeah. You've got to have races everywhere around the world. Yeah. Correct. But there, you can't have every race mm. because then there'll be too many. And I think there will be a saturation point. Mm-hmm. I think that um, when I was a fan, it was difficult enough for me to convince my parents to let me watch the race every Sunday because we had family things to do and you had to go out. And yeah. now there are seven or eight extra weekends that if you want to watch every race, mm-hmm. that's seven or eight extra weekends you've got to give up. Yep. Friday practice is more readily available. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The coverage is better. So the amount of time, if you want to absorb it as a fan and you really want to be in it, you have to give up much more time. And what do you want to do if you want to go watch the Masters Golf? What do you want to do if you want to follow the Premier League? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's. Tr- I think it's challenging to do that. So I think there will be a saturation point. I think that you'll see people in Formula One who work in it, engineers, mm. and to an extent drivers, um, will think actually we probably don't want too many races yeah. because that's the the breaking point too. We've got to see our families, and yeah. you know we've got kids and that kind of thing. But I think at the moment we're just about hanging on Mm -hmm. and this is just about you know the right number but i don't i don't foresee us going miles into like i don't know 30 races we're never going to have that i don't think yeah and i do think we might move to a spot where we rotate races Mm -hmm. so one year it's the french grand prix but that spot is the belgian grand prix the next year correct and i think we might move to that because then you could hit more regions over a period of time can you imagine america you could maybe have eight spots on rotation yep. maybe you always will have to have vegas because it would be so cool yeah. or, or i don't know how it would work but maybe yeah. you have one rotational american spot each year i think that's probably a potential way of kind of getting around that kind of thing amazing mm. speaking of vegas by the way if you have not seen lawrence wearing the vegas jacket oh, yeah. go <laughs> to his instagram that was incredible um final question at q1 what are some of your favorite memories in the paddock like just in the last few years when you look back into the kind of wild show that you've been on for so many years now like, what are some of the core memories you take away and why do they resonate with you? Oh, how long have you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe give us like one or two. Ooh, yeah. I've got <laughs> yeah, yeah. so many great moments. Yeah. So when Daniel Ricciardo won um, the Italian Grand Prix for McLaren, yep. um, I've got to know Daniel over the years and I was really feeling his pain. And you were, we were talking a little bit earlier about like cro- blurring the lines between like being supportive of someone and doing your job and asking the hard questions Mm. and he just had the toughest of years and he obviously went and won that grand prix and he came in the tv pen and i had uh an alcoholic beverage and my shoe (laughs) and i said (laughs) uh it's one of the shoes that i actually wore and actually happened to like so it just so happens that yeah uh, so i said to him okay do you want to do a shoey in my (sighs) shoe Poured in the alcoholic beverage, gave him the shoe, and he did it. Whoa. Wow. Tell me he there's a drank couple of this. out of my shoe. There is video evidence of <laughs> yes, it, yes, photographic right evidence. Yeah. He's even signed the shoe since, and it sat on my desk at home, <laughs> which That's I thought happened. was really cool. Yeah. And I promised him that if he were to then go and win another race, I would do a shoey hmm. in his shoe. Nice. So that will still hold. Yep. If, you know, yep. Hopefully he'll come back next year because I still think he's got a super talent, and mm-hmm. I think he deserves to be on the F1 grid. Um, I will do that. But, you know, that was just a real random moment of, like, it kind of just showed how much that win meant to him. Mm -hmm. It showed the mood that he was in, and it was quite a special moment for me to share in. But also, hopefully, shows the relationship that we'd built um, over the years. Um, Another great moment was when I interviewed Claire Williams Mm. on the last weekend that she and the family were part of the Williams team. And I was really lucky that I got to know Sir Frank um, over the years. He was really supportive of me when I was coming in into journalism and I got to know the family really well. So that was a really challenging weekend because there was a lot of emotion involved. It was a really difficult time. They realized, Claire realized that they had to sell the team to Mm. save the team Mm -hmm. uh, and they had to let go of their baby. Basically, it was part of the family. And so I got to spend a lot of time with Claire over that weekend. I did that one final interview and I remember her welling up talking about the fact that this was going to be the last time that Mm. she was going to be running the team that her father had set up Mm. and to be part of that quite significant moment in history was huge for me because I you know I 
admittedly, I was a Schumacher fan when I was younger <laughs> and he was racing Williams yeah. and Damon Hill at mm -hmm. the time. But Williams always had a really special place for me, um, a really iconic British yeah. team. So to have been able to really embed myself in the latter part of their story mm -hmm. was super cool. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was just, an, you know, one of many really pretty cool opportunities that I've had in, in Formula 1. And, uh, yeah, hopefully there'll be many more to come. Let's do it. I think that was a fantastic Q1, Henny verdict. I got to give that a purple. I think it was a purple. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was the strongest Q1 wow. we've had. Yeah, that was yep. amazing. Right through Q2. Yeah, I'll you take ready? that. Thanks. Thanks. Amazing. <laughs> well, stay tuned, guys. We're going to be back with Lawrence for Q2. Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, hit that subscribe button right now. We really are excited about the community we're building. We have a lot more content we want to share and we'd love for you to be the first one to find out about it. Welcome back to the Track Limits podcast with Lawrence. Lawrence, you're, Q you're through to Q2. How do you feel about that? Oh, I'm delighted. Yeah. There was a with little a bit of tension sector. there. With a purple, <laughs> with a purple here. There's a lot of pressure here. Yeah. Um, in Q2, we want to dive a bit deeper into you as a professional. Cool. And want to go back to like the early days you went to, uh, my God, <laughs> Born Myth. I'm going to pronounce Born it myth. wrong. There yes, you go. God, you Born Myth. <laughs> Thank you. I can, can see the tension. Canadians and Americans, like Americans will empathize with me, but Born Myth, I mean, tell us, what did you study? Did you come in realizing that a career in Formula One is potentially what you wanted to do? Well, firstly, I still can't get over the fact you're calling me a professional. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I take that very okay. kindly. So mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Um, I've got great memories of Bournemouth. Um, so when I was in year nine at secondary school, uh, we had a careers day. And Bournemouth Uni was uh, one of the universities that came to present and try and attract students. And I had done a project a couple of months beforehand where you researched the careers that you wanted to do. And it was mm. journalism and photography were the two that I'd wanted I'd watched the 1994 Australian Grand Prix with my dad. So a pretty special race mm -hmm. to watch to start with. Damon Hill and Michael Schumacher collide. Michael wins the title. And it was then that I decided I wanted to work in Formula One. Mm -hmm. So that's the right beginning of the story. Then as I went through school, essay writing and English were really the only subjects that I felt I was any good at. You know, maths was not my strongest point. Science definitely wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, Let's play to your strengths. And so that's kind of why I focused on trying to get into journalism. But yeah, from a very early stage, that's what I wanted to do. Formula One journalist. That was the peak. That's what I wanted to hit. Um, I've listened to BBC Radio 5 Live a lot. Nice. David Croft was on there. Um, I wanted to be a pit lane reporter like Holly Samos mm -hmm. was at the time. Um, that was the goal. And so um, I'd gone through school and you'd get the kind of nods of like, yes, Lawrence, that's great. It's great <laughs> to have dreams. Yeah, go for it. But, you know, make sure you study all these subjects because, you know, if you don't hit that goal, you might, you might end up in banking or, you know, something else. So just keep your options open. Mm. I was like, no, no. I, <laughs> I want to do want sport it. and I want to yeah, do right. Formula One and this is what I want to do. So I cracked on Bournemouth Uni, best media school in my view at, at that time in the UK. So I was like, right, this is the focus. Mm -hmm. Do whatever you have to to get the grades to get into the uni. Actually, didn't get the grades that I needed to get in. Um, and I remember the phone call outside the school hall and I called them and I was like, I know I haven't got the grades. Like I'm I'm two steps higher in the first two, but I'm one lower than in the other. And they were like, oh yeah, don't worry. Yeah, you, oh, wow. you, you're coming in. Yeah. So it's fine. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And I was like, oh, phew, that was good. <laughs> and I remember going to uni and I met this really inspiring lecturer called Dan Hogan, who's still there. And I still chat to him today. And he was the guy who helped me stand out through the course of my uni would help. He could see how passionate I was about sport, about Formula One and how I was literally so stubborn that I would not stop until I got ideally what I wanted to do. He helped me into this competition called the Bridgestone E-Reporter mm -hmm. where I went to Hungary and I covered the race where Johnson Button won his first oh, race cool. in the wet. Um, and that really gave me an opportunity to meet people. That's where I met Lewis Hamilton for the first time when he was in GP2. Um, and he was the one, Dan Hogan was the guy who kind of helped get my application sorted, inspire me to do different things with my CV. So my CV, uh, I remember I did my first draft yeah. and it was just what any CV I've ever seen was just writing, yeah. Yeah. just yeah. words on it, right? Yeah. And it, he suggested I put pictures oh. of the people that I interviewed on my CV. That's so smart. And I was like, well, this looks silly. Why <laughs> would I do this? And he was like, well, just think about it, right? You're going to get a hundred CVs through. This guy's got a or girl has got to sort through. 
they're going to have to sort it in some way. So they're probably going to pick out the one that looks slightly different. Mm -hmm. And all, so what I did is I picked the pit. So at that time, I'd interviewed Pierce, very randomly, Pierce yeah. Brosnan. Okay. okay. He was in the Matador. <laughs> yeah, uh, Stockard Channin, who's Rizzo in Greece. <laughs> I'd interviewed a stack of people. And I put all these pictures on. Lewis Hamilton was on there. And I managed to get some work experience at the Press Association. And that was the first thing they picked up on. They were like, yeah. why did you put pictures yeah. up? <laughs> and I was like, well, why did you select me? Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was just a quirky way of... Um, getting in but i think he saw that i was just a little bit different mm -hmm. and i was a little bit odd if i'm yeah. honest and he kind of just helped bring that out of me mm. um and so i did this multimedia journalism degree at bournemouth uh so i did radio tv print yeah. online was only just starting that shows mm. how old i am right. only online was only just starting to come through mm. and i just did as much work experience as i could i did national papers i did online property websites i did wow. literally anything yeah. where I could go and work in an environment to kind of see what suited me, mm. where I thought I could be successful in. Um, and that kind of helped shape what I was going to do going forward, how I would approach job applications um, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's kind of how it all started. Just mm. tried to throw myself into it. Mm. Very bloody minded. Had <laughs> two very supportive parents who were like, yeah, go and do work experience here. Go and do that. Yeah. They'd take me here. They'd help me, you know, sort this thing out. So... I was very lucky that I had a lot of people around me that kind of helped do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I got to live in Bournemouth, which yeah. is on the south coast of the UK on a sandy beach where I got to run every morning. So oh. I had the best time. I'm That's going wonderful. there. I'm yeah. going to go there. I'm going to nail my pronunciation. Yep. Oh, yeah. Do, I'm it. Come back. Is, do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> but like growing up, did you ever have an inkling of mm. you wanting to be a race driver at all? Oh, like I'd, I would have loved it. Yeah. Like I had a scale at tricks when I was younger. Um, my parents took me go karting. We had birthday parties with go karting. Um, I always wanted to do my driving lessons as soon as I could. Like that was an aspiration yeah. to learn to drive as quickly as I could. I loved doing simulators, but the the constant among all of it, oh, well, it just wasn't very good mm. because the problem was I'd accelerate down a straight and I would just break earlier than everyone yeah. else <laughs> because of the it, it was the fear factor, yeah, yeah, like yeah. the fear yeah. of crashing. And actually, I was very light. So I was very little. I had all of the the Trait characteristics yeah, yeah, yeah. and traits yeah, to yeah. be a good racing driver but yeah. i just didn't have that final hmm. um X kind of yeah, yeah exactly and so i realized that that wasn't going to be the case still love go 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 and go karting mm. and i still love trying single seaters out if i ever get an opportunity or driving i, I kind of like saloon cars a little bit more i get more of a kick out of that if yeah. i get a chance to drive on the circuit but um i still love doing all of that but i just i knew what my limits were yeah. mm -hmm. and my limits were I wasn't going to be a racing driver. So what is the next best thing? Mm. And that's kind of being part of Formula One. And that's what's great about this sport is that you can work in legal, you can work in finance, you can be an engineer, you can be a driver. Marketing. Marketing, yeah. Yeah. hospitality, mm -hmm. communications. Mm -hmm. You can still be part of Formula One. You don't have to be a racing driver. And I think that's what's great about it. So, um, yeah, I was still bloody minded. I wanted, <laughs> to be, I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be that pit lane reporter. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to interview drivers. Um, so yeah, so I just cracked on. That was always the goal. Right. Nice. And it seems like what, and I'd love to hear from you kind of what you think made you so successful as a journalist. But I think one of the things I'm taking away is just the fact that you were relentless and you were more importantly, like willing to put yourself out there, you know, ask for favors, you know, pepper people if need be to like try to get an interview and try to stand out. Do you think those are some of the elements that made you a little bit special and more successful perhaps in your, in your field? Poss possibly. I'm really not very good at kind of understanding why I've managed mm -hmm. to do what I've managed to do. Um, I just, I've just always tried to take the opportunities that have been presented to myself. Like mm -hmm. I've, I feel like my parents gave me a lot of opportunities. So I felt like it was my duty to take those opportunities and then try and make the best out of it, I think. And I've been very lucky along the way that several people have been very supportive. Like I met Will Buxton on that weekend in Hungary when I did the B, uh, British Journey E-Reporter competition. And now I work alongside him presenting him. Mm -hmm. That is remarkable. I met Lee McKenzie, a, a Channel 4 um presenter who I now work alongside mm -hmm. at that weekend. James Allen, who who was a pit lane reporter, he was very supportive in the early part of my career. Tom Clarkson. There were a, a billion people, and Bradshaw, who's yeah. been in, you know, comms, one of the best comms people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. There were tons of people who were supportive, but I always just tried to show that I was keen. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I was good and they saw that I was good and they wanted to support me and just try and put all the pieces of the puzzle together to try and take the most... Uh, 
take these opportunities going forward. Yeah. And on the flip side, has there been a moment where you're like, I screwed up, like I did <laughs> oh. something wrong, whether it was on live television or even just journalism where you got it all wrong? There's, there's loads of those yeah. because the reality is you can't get it right every time. Yeah. You can't always ask the question in the right way. Mm-hmm. You can't always have seen everything. So there are moments in the TV pen when I have to interview all 20 drivers. Whereas the reality is I can't follow 20 drivers individual race. So there will be times when I have to maybe be a bit more open with my questioning on someone who's finished 17 to 18, 19. Mm -hmm. Or I've got it wrong. Like there were so many, say, accidents or tire strategies where I've gone, oh, you you did that. And they're like, no, I didn't. And the reality is that's going to happen. I'm not, it's not because I haven't, watch the race is i've just made an error because there's a confusion mm. and sometimes that happens but i just tr- obviously i try to minimize those things yeah. um but i think i had a really good grounding early on in my journalism career i worked for a magazine called sport it was a weekly magazine where we covered all sports i went in there as the only person who was interested in motorsports they were like well yeah go on you can go <laughs> cover that Take the whole department <laughs> exactly yeah. you yeah. go do it and i was like yeah. All right then. <laughs> and I interviewed Lewis Hamilton, Valentino Rossi, Jensen Button, Fernando Alonso. Um, Quite the roster there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did that probably in the first year or so. And they were cover features. And I just wow. thought, well, this is great. Yeah. Like, they're big names. but yep. And you kind of know what you're talking about. Um, and that was cool. But I also went and did other things. So I interviewed Mark Cavendish, a really successful cyclist for, for the Isle of Man here. Um, I did rugby players. I did footballers. Uh, Andy Murray tennis players and what was great about that is I really had to go and learn those sports I had to really get better at researching I had to get an idea of how to question this person to learn this new person's mannerisms Mm. to learn how they are best how I can get the best out of them and actually that was the best grounding I could have because it it kind of taught me how to approach interviews differently depending on who I was interviewing Mm. how I would write my question like I don't write questions really anymore First interviews I did, I used to write reams and reams and reams. Yeah. Now I've just I write them down before the interview mm. or notes, mm. and that goes into my head. Wow. And then when I do the interview, I just do what I'm doing with you guys now. I just have a chat to them, yep. and it kind of because I've done it so often now, yeah. it's in my head. Um, I wouldn't recommend that as a strategy <laughs> yeah. in your I'm first like, couple of interviews. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do that right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe this. like further down the line, yeah, though, yeah. it yeah. kind of builds in, and so and then you're a bit more relaxed and it's mm-hmm. a bit more conversational. But I only learned that skill 10, 12 years ago by doing all of the things that weren't facing Lewis Hamilton at when he's just got out of the car <laughs> yeah. and won the world title. I had to go and do that ground in somewhere else. So I think it's it's about patience. I know that word is because I'm so stubborn, I hate that word. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, you just have to go and do all of that stuff so that you can be the best that you can be further down the line. Mm. Like, there's no way I could do the TV pen in my first job out of university. I just couldn't do it. I wouldn't know how to uh, to deal with all those drivers coming in so quickly, how to read a race, how to take notes on a race. I just wouldn't know any of that stuff. So it, I'm really glad that I've kind of taken that pathway, which is trying to do lots of different sports and then work my way through. Um but I'm also really lucky that I've had so many opportunities along the way. Yep. And then diversity is obviously a hot topic right now. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people look at the drivers and they feel like, okay, there's a lot of room for more diversity among the 20 drivers. Is that the same also for journalism and reporting? Like, is there, you know, something that needs to be done even across the paddock beyond even just the drivers, do you feel? I think that, I think there needs to be better diversity across the board. Right. I, and But I think that's not just Formula One, that's all sport and the world. True. I think people just need to have more opportunities. I mm-hmm. think that there, there just needs to be an understanding that actually the best person for the job is, it could be anyone. Mm-hmm. And you need to have an open mind for that. Mm-hmm. But I also think that more people need to have the opportunity from a grassroots level. And that might be better education. That might be better opportunities to go go karting mm-hmm. and, and better funding for that. That might be a better way of getting into the legal service because we go back to that same topic. There were multiple jobs in Formula One. Yep. And everyone just needs the ground in early on and that access opportunities there. So that in 10 to 15 years, when you go for a job interview and you're looking for a reporter and you want to try and open it up, the 10 people you're coming to are the best in the field and they're all from different backgrounds. Mm. And therefore, you are picking the best person based on the best person for that job. And you've got a great selection to choose from. What I think you probably don't want to have to do is be forced to take people Correct. in positions yep. where they aren't the best. Because mm. then it's not fair on the person who is the best exactly. not getting the opportunity. Yep. And I think that will take time. Mm. But I think what is great is 
we are doing things to try. F1 Academy mm -hmm. is trying to bring f young female racers mm -hmm. through from a grassroots level. I think you look at all of the teams and they are looking at how they can do internships. They're doing how they change the way they recruit, yeah. how they support local universities, how you do all of these things that mm -hmm. hopefully then go, people go, actually, I can do that. Yeah. Um, when I was first um, a journalist, first a permanent journalist in Formula One, there weren't very many people who looked like me. Mm. I think that's the truth. Yeah. I never felt out of place. Like I never felt like anyone treated me differently, mm. but I did feel like it was very clear that I was very different to those around me. Um, and I'm pleased to say that that is changing. Mm. Um, it's probably not changing as quickly as some people might want, but I think that's the reality of the situation. As long as we're going in an upward trajectory, yeah. as long as people, when I meet fans, um, what is great is that they they now feel like there is an opportunity. Yeah. Whether or not they achieve the opportunity is a different thing altogether. But if they feel like there's a chance, that's already a game changer, I think. I think there might be people who might thought, I could never work in Formula 1 because there's no one there who looks like no me thing, or, yeah. or acts like me or, or is me. And I think that is changing. And I think hopefully if more people do break through and they see that they are successful, that is proof that there will be more that will come through. Yeah. On the fun side, though, sh share a story with us that you've never told anyone <laughs> that has happened on a race weekend. Boom. That I've never told anyone on a race weekend. Yeah. That is a really difficult question. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. I, because yeah. um, I'm not very good at, like, not telling stories. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I have so many outlets of, like, I can I write about things, I do podcasts, um, about it that it's actually really difficult mm. to to come up with something that I've never told yeah. anyone ever. Um oh damn it. I'm uh, <laughs> what can I what can I tell you about it? Or a rumor that you know is true. Yeah. When is Lewis retiring? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the thing is yeah. about the on that while I think about the other question. Nice. Yeah. It is quite challenging when you know stuff that's going on mm. that you can't report on yet because you want to get it out there mm -hmm. like it's really exciting mm. um but also it depends what you've committed to your source it depends whether actually if you wait a little bit longer you'll get a better story out mm -hmm. of it so actually that is the real challenge and the real experience that you learn that actually sometimes okay i found out this piece of information and i could break it now and that is great and you will do that sometimes but actually wait two or three days talk to this other person and then you've got this explosive bigger, yeah. story yeah. right yeah i remember when i was working at autosport and i spent a bit of time trying to work out it's a little bit smaller but like who was going to be the next toro rosso driver when they were changing things up and mm -hmm. do you remember there was that year where gasly had to go oh, yeah. brendan hartley had to go sebastian buemi was linked to that seat and i just i found out it was going to be brendan hartley was going to get this shot and i remember talking to my colleagues in the office and I was like, so I'm going to write this story and they're like, there's no way it's Brendan Hartley. Like, <laughs> there's just no way it is. And I was like, well, I'm I'm, I'm 100% certain mm -hmm. that it is this story. And they were like, it's no way it is. And so I went in and I talked to uh, several more people. Then I found out why it wasn't, why it wasn't Buemi mm. anymore. Then I found out why it definitely was Brendan Hartley going to be in and more detail on that story. And yeah. I found so much more out on that story and yeah. then I broke it. And actually it was a great story then. Yeah. It still would have been cool if I'd broken it and I'd, I'd said time. it was Brendan Hartley because yeah. it was true and I was confident of that. Mm. But it was such a good story thereafter because of the way um, that it was being. Yeah, anyway, yeah. so that was um, that was a cool thing. So a story that I've never told. There yep. we go, ah, I got it. There okay. we go. So I went to, some of the cool things that you get to do after races is you get to go and do an event after a race. Mm. And one of them that we did was we went to Baku um, after a Grand Prix. It must have been Abu Dhabi. When Daniel Ricciardo was the ambassador for Baku. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember, right at the beginning of mm -hmm. the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, they picked drivers each year to yeah. be an ambassador. I think mm -hmm. Alonso was one one year. Mm -hmm. And Ricciardo um, was this one this year. And I remember we went, uh, we turned up to the, um, we turned up to the, to the event. We stayed in the Hilton Hotel, which is the one in the center of the circuit. Yeah. And we're at a rooftop bar um, at the end of this day. And we'd done this whole junket, hit up to go and do, talk to all of these media, blah de blah de blah. He had to sit down to dinner with us, and <laughs> uh, the, like assembled media. Yeah. And then we went up to this rooftop bar and this was the first time that I'd spent with him like in a non um, Work environment. formal yeah. environment. Yeah. Even the dinner, this was the first. This was like a step on from mm -hmm. a media mm -hmm. dinner okay. because the media dinner you're still kind of switched on because yeah. you're talking to media. Yeah, and we were in this bar at the top, and that was the first time that I saw him like kick back, have a drink, yeah. 
relax, show me who the real Daniel mm. Ricardo is, cracking a few more jokes, yeah. going mm. out. He had, I remember he had a new costume that, like a new, <laughs> uh, like a uniform or clothing. Yeah. No, he had like this military like um, outfit that he'd had right. that he'd just had been sent by whoever the clothing designer was yeah. working. And he was like, you know what, guys, I'm going to go and show you what it is. Goes out, gets changed, <laughs> oh comes God. in this costume. And like this whole thing is quite surreal. Yeah. I can't believe I've just remembered the story. Yeah. This thing was quite surreal because for me, this was the first real insight that I'd had into it. Like I'd had dinners with drivers off yeah. record and stuff. But this was the first time that I've seen like a real personality. And the irony is, as I've got to know him afterwards, that's who he is. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You know, this is the kind of guy who kick, likes to kick back, likes to talk about things that isn't Formula One, likes to kind of connect with you and have a good laugh, have a good time, have a laugh and stuff. Mm. And so that was a real, real insight for me of like how lucky I was to see that kind of side of him that I know now we kind of get to see a bit mm. more about him anyway. Mm. But it was a cool, that was a real cool thing for me to do because it was non-race weekend. Yep. It was a, it was another like uh, event for me to cover uh, and I got a really good feature out of it. And so, so yeah, many it was F1 cool. fans are probably so happy because yeah. sometimes, you know, you see somebody on TV and they can be very different in person. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice to hear that, that somebody he's, like Daniel yeah. is a very chill person, even when the cameras aren't on him and even in like a, a non-work setting. He is 100% yeah. the same. Maybe. Like he does not change at, at all. When you see him upset or sad or happy or ecstatic no. or frustrated, like when he, there was a moment, I remember he told me that he, in Mexico one year, something had happened in qualifying. He was so frustrated. He went and got some plates and smashed them out <laughs> the back of the, um, <laughs> the um, most home. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And often you don't ever hear that kind of stuff because you don't, they don't want to maybe, um, Change the narrative? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But actually, he had every right to be annoyed yeah. about what had happened. Mm. And breaking plates is sometimes quite a therapeutic yeah. thing yeah. to do. And he it. wasn't being aggressive and right. he wasn't he didn't hurt himself or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was that was a real moment of finding out a little bit about him. And those stories only ever come out if you're really comfortable with that person. Yeah. Um yeah. and obviously by by the way, like I would always check with him yeah, beforehand. whether or not he's comfortable. Yeah. Like I would never have recited this story just now yeah. if he, I know that he wasn't going to be comfortable with those kind of stories. Yeah. There will be stories that I can't tell yeah. of, with people, yeah. but the only way that you ever make progress is if you keep the secrets that you need to keep with and you tell the stories that you're comfortable with. But yeah. hopefully you can tell, you can find a way where you can tell yeah. some cool stories like that. Yeah. Incredible. Q2 verdict? Man, that story is a purple. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two purples. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think we have ever given two no, purples. No, I don't think so. No. But it would be really sad if you did not get pole, pole. now. Yeah. yeah. So so I'm under pressure now. Yeah. Yeah. Real, yeah. Final Q3 coming with Lawrence. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Track Limits podcast. We are now getting into Q3 with Lawrence Barreto. Lawrence, nervous? A little bit, because I don't want to lock up right at the yeah. final corner and really let go, because it's going pretty well yeah. so far. Yeah, That's two cool. purples so far. Last sector. Last sector here. It. Let's see. First question right away, Lawrence. We're going to give you a bunch of questions, see how rapid and fire your answers can be. Okay. If you had to choose one platform to post on forever, which one would it be? Instagram. Oh, okay. I love it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> perfect. So this, for audio listeners, this is a photo of you, you know. <laughs> fashion on point this was in 2020 what oh was my going on <laughs> this was the moon boots scenario yeah, yeah. <laughs> moon boots my favorite gray coat my woolly yellow ha oh yeah that was a look wasn't it <laughs> yeah, that, that was a it. strong look I, so the first time i wore those moon boots was really? in russia winter olympics stay okay. with me yeah. home is the winter olympics it was 25 degrees yeah. but i'd committed to them mm. so i wore them for as long as i could until yeah. my feet started burning had to take them off but that was at the nurberg oh. ring and it was so wet and everyone who had mocked me in russia <laughs> were like ah oh, you've got the right footwear yeah. in the uh, in the uh, nurberg ring because my feet were toasty oh, my God. oh yeah that was a funny <laughs> moment nice. next one which one out of the big social media platforms would you delete if you had to mm. Um, probably Facebook because okay. I just don't really use it yeah. anymore and I feel like it's just it had its time and it was great but I, yeah it's just probably not my favorite anymore cool. nice what driver would you trust to drive you blindfolded around a track <laughs> actually most of them oh, oddly, okay. because I've got a lot of trust in all of them yeah. but the one I would trust the most is Carlos Sainz I think nice all right which driver in your opinion is the greatest driver of all time it was initially Michael Schumacher because I was a massive Schumacher fan. But watching Lewis and what he's doing now, I just can't see how there's anyone better than him. Yeah, great. 
Beautiful. What technical directive would you put in in 2026 with the mm -hmm. new regulations coming in? Ah, uh, to make the cars smaller and lighter. Because I, I was amazed when mm -hmm. I saw the current car next to the cars that I used yeah. to watch. And when you watch them side by side, they're so different. Oh, yeah. So, and when I talk to drivers, they all want lighter, smaller cars. They want to go faster. <laughs> we should clip them just like at F1. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you were an F1 driver, which team would you want to drive for? Uh, Williams. Okay. Uh, who would you want as a teammate on the current grid? And who would you not want <laughs> as a teammate? Um, I would probably not want Max as a teammate because <laughs> yeah. he's too damn good right now. Yeah. Um, who would I love? Um, oh, loads of them. I would love Charles would be cool. Pierre would be cool. Um, Carlos would be cool. Oh, damn it. Do I have to pick one? <laughs> one. Oh, um, um, oh, the stre this is stressful. <laughs> I'm going to say Charles. Ah. Okay. What's the most over-asked question that you get? And then what is the question you don't like asking as a journalist? Like you just like staying away from it. So the question I don't like asking is when they've had a bad day mm -hmm. and for them to explain if they've made an error, like I have to ask them to explain it or give a real insight into it because at that point in time, mm -hmm. they do not want to answer <laughs> it. So that was tricky because like Gasly, just this last race, I was second question in oh. and he was like, he'd obviously had that shunt. Yeah. And he was like, I'm not having this. And he walked off. And I was like, well, I had to, you know, you have to ask to. the questions, right? Yep. So, but that showed the emotion. So those, some of those interviews are actually the best ones because it shows, I know this is a very quick fire. The question that I, uh, the, I've asked the question. That is over asked, asked. to you. Um, who's my favorite driver probably? Because <laughs> I find that quite hard to <laughs> yeah, answer. Yeah. yeah, cool. Nice. Funniest media comment that you've received. <laughs> Um, it's normally about my shoes. Ah, yeah. It's like yes. uh, there's always a lot of love yeah. for my shoes, which yeah. I think is nice. So um, there's uh, it, probably about the moon boots, to yes. be honest. Oh, okay. What piece favorite. of F1 memorabilia would you like to own or do you currently own that you just love? I would love a front wing of a Formula 1 car that I could hang above my dining table. That is the dream. I would Actually. absolutely love it. <sighs> what well, um, Next question is, if you can have one superpower, what would it be? Mm. Um, to fly mm. because I think I'm really scared of doing things like bungee jumping or skydiving. <laughs> so if you've got, yeah, hate, but I if you've heights. got the superpower, right, yeah. presumably it's a reasonably safe thing to do to fly. So that's what I'd love. And to you do. wouldn't, well, I mean, hopefully you wouldn't fear it because yeah. imagine having that ability and then you're like, oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, I think that's what I'd love to do. Cool. What celebrity do you think would be a good fit to play an F1 driver in a movie? Any celebrity in the world. Oh, I've got to say Brad Pitt. Yeah. Because obviously, <laughs> we're going to hopefully see it very, very soon. I can't wait. With yeah. Lewis, right? I think yeah, Lewis is I think for Lewis is going to be involved. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay nice. Cool. Wildest prediction for this this season? Wildest. Oh, damn it. Because this season is looking quite... Uh, <laughs> Linear. Straight down yeah, the line, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that we're going to see Fernando Alonso win multiple races. I don't Ooh. know if that's wild, okay. but I think we're going to see him win multiple, multiple. races. I think, yeah, win yeah. a race would not have been wild, but win multiple. multiple. Yeah, that's, that's a wild one. There you go. That's about as wild as I can get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, final question. You're writing an autobiography on your life. Which of these titles best resonates with you? The Daredevil, The Hardest Worker, The Free Spirit, or The Dream Catcher? Or the fashion master. Or the fashion <laughs> master, yeah. The man with the boots. The man uh, with the boots. I think probably, I think, oh, it's a cross between the dream catcher, yeah. because yeah. honestly, this is a dream, and mm -hmm. I, I hope it inspires people to chase their dreams. Mm -hmm. But now you've thrown in the fashion <laughs> <laughs> element, and I do love fashion. Yeah. So maybe if I could find a, a mix of both of them. I feel like the AlphaTauri car launch must have been a dream for you too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was great, fashion because I love AlphaTauri gear. I mean, admittedly, they are our premium fashion partner, so yep. I do wear a lot of their gear, and you might expect me to say that. But I'm very lucky that it fits me very well. Yeah. Incredible. Well, well we, we love it too. Yeah, we love it too. Oh, yeah, we fabric. were just like, wait, we get to wear this? Yeah. <laughs> like, so nice. Um, thanks so much, Lawrence, for coming on. We no really worries. do appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me. We ask every guest a question at the very end. You know, mm -hmm. at the very beginning, you gave us in 30 seconds your career thus far. But I'm curious, how, what sort of legacy do you want to leave behind? You know, when it's all said and done, what do you want people to remember you for? I don't think that... I feel like I need to be remembered, if right. I'm honest. I think that I'm here to have a lot of fun, to hopefully inspire a lot of people, and hopefully people enjoy what I read or what what I uh, sorry what I write or mm -hmm. what they see the content that we make. Hopefully, it just brings some joy to people's lives. So I think if people um, continue to do, to do that and they've enjoyed what 
uh, the kind of content that I make, that's a good thing, I think. But I don't honestly look at things like that because I'm just me. Like, I just don't think that what I'm doing is special. And he, oh. Is that Paul? I think that's yeah. Paul. Yeah. That's Paul. <laughs> He's got it. He's got it. Bang, bang. <laughs> purple, purple, purple. We have honestly not Never. had a purple, Never. purple, purple. Oh, well, you know? I'll take that. Yeah. Seriously. That is great. That's crazy. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks so much again, Lawrence. And I think Thanks, one of the chef. cool things, nice. you're a humble guy, but it's incredible what you've done. That's seriously. Far, so. uh, that's very kind. Thank you for coming on. We really do appreciate your time. Guys, if you want to check out Lawrence, you can check him out on social media. We're going to link everything in the show description. If you like this episode and my pronunciation of, oh my God, <laughs> Bournemouth. Oh, no. You've nailed it. Bournemouth. I nailed it. Oh, thank yeah. God. I thought I got it wrong. <laughs> if you enjoyed my pronunciation of that and want to see even more content, go to tracklimitspod.com, check out our other episodes, and we will see you in the next one.